Think of your business as a human being where it requires a brain and a heart to function. Your passion is your heart. It is not to be ignored. Hello and good day. I'm Renee Perry and welcome to Business Success Starts with Loving Your Work podcast. There is a big, big misconception about what passion is. Passion is kind of like the middle child where nobody really understands it, so it just gets ignored. Passion at work is not something you are doing. It's not an activity. It is how you are feeling. It's an emotion. The activity what you are doing is the conduit for your passions. Passion is what drives, motivates, and implores you to push past your limitations. It's what gives you fuel to keep going and to continue doing what you love. How many times have you heard, follow your passions? But according to a Deloitte survey of 3,000 full-time U.S. workers, and this is across job levels and industries, only 20% say they are truly passionate about their work. Only 20%. The study also found that employees want to be passionate and want to make a positive impact. However, research shows that many, if not most of us, We don't know how to pursue our passion, and so we don't, and so we fail to do so. We just ignore it like the middle child that it is. Do I sound like a middle child right now? I want you to imagine this. You wake up in the morning and you are excited about going to work. You feel motivated, driven, and ready to take on any and all challenges. You feel fully on fire and passionate about what you are doing. What would it be like to feel this way in your business? If you feel passionate about your work, you will feel this way at least most of the time. When you are doing work that connects you to what you care about the most, then you will feel passionate. We talked about loving your work on the last podcast, and today we are going to dig into one of the components to loving your work, out of many, and that is passion. And just a quick refresher from the last podcast, there are a few components to loving your work, and they include, along with passion, your interests, your natural abilities, your core values, your strengths, your skills, your uniqueness, your vision, and your goals. You're comprised of many gifts. I know you don't always or often feel that way, but I am here to tell you that you are. According to the National Institutes of Health.gov in 2021, the last couple of decades have seen an explosion of research in positive psychology or the study of the factors that make life more fulfilling because, honestly, we are all in the pursuit to feel more fulfilled in our work and life. One such factor is passion. Passion leads people to choose to engage in the activity that they love. Many different researchers, the last one being in 2020 by Pollock et al., have shown that passions first leads to adaptive processes such as flow, which is a complete absorption of oneself and what one's doing. Second, passion leads to the mastery of goals. Third, passion leads to task coping, which is problem-focused strategies altering a situation. And last, passion leads to adaptive outcomes such as positive emotions, subjective vitality, and well-being. This research proves the huge positive impact that passion plays in your work and life. What is passion? We hear a lot about it, but it's talked about in different ways. As a matter of fact, it's very confusing to me. Although sometimes that's not hard these days. When people discuss passion, or or it used to be confusing to me, I had this fellow named Mike call me up years ago to tell me that he didn't believe in following your passions. He was that blunt with me. I I didn't know him. A lady from a networking group I was involved in had him call me, and to this day, I'm not exactly sure why. He said he was passionate about playing baseball, and there was no way he could do this as a job. Because I didn't know him, and he threw me off, and I'm not always the fastest thinker on my feet. I didn't feel compelled to talk him out of what he believed. I I just knew that that wasn't going to be worth my time anyway. So that was pretty much the end of our conversation. I knew he was upset, that he believed he wasn't good enough to follow his passion. But what he said and how he was irritated by what he believed made me realize that on one hand, I agreed with him, and on the other hand, I didn't. It struck me that 
he is probably not the only person confused about what passion actually is because it has confused me as well. This caused me to go on a journey to figure it out. Through time, I understood that it's believed that passion is something you do, but it's not. And because we can't even understand what passion is, we don't know how to pursue our passions as uncovered by the Deloitte survey. In the Webster Dictionary, the meaning of the word passion is an intense, driving, or overmastering feeling or conviction. Passion is an intense, driving, or overmastering feeling or conviction. It's an emotion of strong or extravagant fondness, enthusiasm, or desire for something. Passion motivates and drives us to continue doing what matters to us. As Oprah has said, okay, this isn't in the dictionary, at least not yet. Passion is energy. Feel the power that comes from focusing on what excites you. Passion is not what you are doing. Instead, it is how you are feeling. I was a runner for 35 years. Some people would say that running is my passion. The physical activity of running is not a passion. It can be the conduit of my passions. When I ran, I felt the freedom and control. I loved feeling free and to have the control to run where I wanted to run at the speed I wanted to go. I loved being on my own and responsible for how good or bad I was. The confusion about passion is created when people talk about passion as something you are doing and not what truly motivates you. For example, I want, to, I want to read to you a clip of what Mark Cuban said as part of the Amazon's Insights for Entrepreneurs series. And if you don't know who he is, he is an American businessman, an investor, a film producer, a television personality, and he happens to be a billionaire. You may know him from Shark Tank. He said, and I quote, One of the great lies of life is to follow your passions. Everybody tells you, follow your passion, follow your passion. I used to be passionate to be a baseball player. Then I realized I had a 70 mile per hour fastball. Competitive major league pitchers throw fastballs in the range of 90 plus miles per hour. When you look at where you put in your time, where you put in your effort, that tends to be the things that you are good at. And if you put in enough time, you tend to get really good at it. If you put in enough time and you get really good, I will give you a little secret. Nobody quits anything they are good at because it is fun to be good. It is fun to be one of the best. End of quote. Okay, let us unpack this. First, Mark Cuban is talking about baseball as being a passion. Baseball is an activity. Passion is a driver or what motivates you to do this activity. He says on one hand, don't follow your passions because you couldn't get to a 90 mile per hour fastball. And then he states, If you put in enough time and you get really good, you won't quit what you're good at. To me, those are competing ideas. He obviously quit trying to throw a 90 mile per hour fastball. So is baseball really a passion of his? Or quite possibly it fulfilled one passion of his, but we have several passions and maybe it didn't fulfill enough of them for him to continue. He does give away one of his passions in this exchange, however. He says that nobody quits anything they are good at because it is fun to be good. It is fun to be one of the best. This is definitely one driver for Mark Cuban. I guarantee it. A side note, being one of the best doesn't drive everyone as he believes. I can tell you this as someone who has worked with many people to define what their passions are. I'm going to throw in a quick example to counter what Mark Cuban says about baseball being his passion and that he wasn't good enough to be a baseball player regardless of how passionate he was, because he couldn't throw a 90-mile-per-hour fastball. When I was young, I read a biography on Wilma Rudolph, and I was instantly fascinated and inspired by her. Maybe you have never heard of her, so let me tell you a little bit about her. Wilma Rudolph was born in 1940 in St. Bethlehem, Tennessee. She was one of 22 children. Just saying that makes me feel a little tired. She survived bouts of polio and scarlet fever, which was devastating in those days with no vaccinations. The polio vaccine didn't come out until the mid-50s. Her illness forced her to wear a brace on her leg, and her diagnosis was pretty bleak. She is quoted as saying, My doctor told me I would never walk again. My mother told me I would. I believed my mother. Have you ever been told by an expert something that you in turn defied? Together, Wilma's parents and siblings took turns taking care of her, often removing her leg brace and massaging her injured leg. 
At the age of six, Wilma began to hop on one leg, defying the doctors. By eight, she could move around with a leg brace. At the age of 11, Wilma's mother discovered her playing basketball outside. Wilma quickly turned to sports. She was nominated as an All-American in basketball during high school. However, after a chance meeting with a college coach, she turned to track and field. Wilma Rudolph headed to the 1960 Summer Olympics, determined to get gold at the age of 20. Her performance in Rome cemented her as one of the greatest athletes of the 20th century. She won three gold medals and broke three world records. Wilma Rudolph became the first American woman to win three gold medals in track and field at the same Olympic game. Her performance also earned her the title of the fastest woman in the world. So this woman, who was never supposed to walk again, became the fastest runner in the world. What is the difference between Mark Cuban and Wilma Rudolph? Maybe Mark Cuban wasn't passionate enough about baseball, or he would have worked on his fast pitch more and never given up. Wilma Rudolph was told she'd never walk again. What motivated her to push beyond her limits to not just walk again, but to become the fastest woman in the world in 1960? Passion. Let's continue to break down what passion is. We have several passions, several things that drive and motivate us, not just one. I quit running after I broke my foot my senior year in cross country. I'd become the fastest runner on our team and was the first female to make all conference in Lockport. But after I broke my foot, I was done with running for, for the most part. I continued running competitive, competitively with a running club, but it, it was just in my spare time only. I wasn't passionate enough about running to continue beyond running for the exercise of it. When it came to my career in eighth grade, I made a decision that I would like to become a secretary. I made this decision because I knew my mom was a secretary before she met my dad, so it sounded kind of cool. And also, I loved and was inspired by Della Street and Perry Mason. I know, I keep aging myself. She was the person who kept Perry Mason successful as a lawyer, and I kind of wanted to do the same thing. I was also inspired by how, as a team, they brought some small justice to injustices created in society. In the 80s, I was lucky that I could take secretarial classes in high school. I graduated, and then I got a job a few months later doing what I wanted to do as a legal secretary. My dad is the one I can thank for giving me the ability and thought to follow my passions. He's also, he also is the reason I am passionate about creating fairness throughout my career to the best of my ability to everyone I work with, customers, vendors, and employees. My dad had rheumatic fever twice as a kid and never should have survived. He did survive, but was ill for most of my life and his own. He worked full-time because he had to feed five kids and didn't have heart surgery until he turned 50. I was terrified all of my childhood that he would die while us kids were young. My mom had her own issues, and I knew she wasn't capable of working and taking care of us kids. And so I constantly worried that with us living paycheck to paycheck and struggling to buy even food, that if dad died, we would be on the streets somewhere. I didn't think it was fair. It wasn't fair that he could be working so hard, doing all of the right things, and still struggle to maintain a family with their simple needs. These challenges motivated me to run my business a certain way. I tell you this to explain how we have a few passions, a few things that drive us. And even more importantly, what has caused us a lot of pain or great challenges are often how our passions are born. Let me say that again. What has caused us a lot of pain or great challenges are often how our passions are born. I want to give you another example describing passion, but in a different way and at a different angle. I worked with a client some time ago. Her name was Kim, and she couldn't understand why she never finished anything. Kim would get involved in something, do it for a little bit, and then move on to something else. She had been like this since she could remember, since she was a little girl. Her family would give her a hard time for starting things and never getting to be excellent or the best at it because she quit it. She too then started judging herself as there being something wrong with her. She believed and was made to believe that she was a quitter. Yet when we narrowed down what her passions were, one of her passions was to try as many things as possible. It wasn't to set some goals and continue it. 
it was strictly to try as many things as possible. Here she thought something was wrong with her. She was taught to hate this aspect about herself, when in reality, she was following her passion, yet didn't recognize it for what it was. I'm bringing this up because it's important that we don't judge others and in doing so suppress who they really are and what their passions are. By not judging, we give room for others to build confidence and acceptance in who they are and what they really want. Our activities and challenges can bring forth our passions. Our passions implore, motivate, and drive us to push limits. Now let's take some time to have you think about what your passions are. I'm going to ask you three questions to help you discover what you're, you are passionate about. The first question. What does your dream job look like? Be honest with yourself. Break this down to every factor. Environment, what you are doing, who you are working with. Where are you doing this and why? Number two. When listening to podcasts or reading your favorite books, which stories attract you most? Why are you attracted to those stories? What about those stories hold your attention? Keep asking yourself why until it is narrowed down to as far as you can go. And number three, if you could share with the world a challenge you faced and what everyone should know because of this challenge, what would be your message to everyone? After taking some time to answer these questions, you should discover a few passions along the way. Remember to keep narrowing your answers down to just a few words. Do you notice any of the same passions under different questions that show up for you? When you come up with what you are passionate about, think about how these passions have weaved their way into what you are doing now. How have your passions affected your decisions in life so far? I find that most people want to start a business that they feel passionate about. You may have questions about what I do, and if so, go to my website for more information, renaeperrybusiness.com. As we come to a close, Mark Cuban is obviously brilliant and passionate in business, but I'm going to say this with the utmost respect. He has passion wrong. Your passions in business doesn't just allow you to be truly connected with your work. It also aids in your fulfillment, mastery of goals, strategizing, and well-being. Listen, the passion that Wilma Rudolph displayed with her running is within you. It's within all of us, in our own unique and different way. I've heard some people say they have no passion. As my dad would say, hogwash. You can't be alive and not have passions. Let's just say I haven't met anyone in my 20 years of doing what I do who hasn't had any passions. Discovering your passion starts with understanding what passion really is. And then it's important to purge. Purge the ideas of who you should be, must be, have to be, in order to be successful in your life. Just like when I talked about Kim. It's about following who you really are. God doesn't make mistakes. Put your overthinking brain on a shelf for a while and feel what motivates and excites you. Just, just feel it. Accept yourself and what you're passionate about and then tell someone near and dear to you what that is. Thank you for joining me and I look forward to next time. <laughs>